Okay, so. Hello everyone. Uh, I am Annie Kaznab, Kaznab from EC Bern. And uh, I have the great pleasure to welcome today Professor Stefan Belcher uh, for a lecture on extreme weather and climate. Uh, and uh, as you will see, a very timely topic. So let me introduce uh, briefly Professor Stefan Belcher. He is director of the Hadley Center of the Met Office in the UK. Uh, his group uh, gathers more than uh, 500 uh, research scientists, and uh, he, this group is uh, inter internationally uh, renowned for research on weather and climate science and uh, uh, for the translation to, of this science to weather and climate services for daily weather for forecasts, emergency response to geohazards, and uh, climate change mitigation for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, Stephen Belcher obtained his PhD in fluid dynamics from the University of Cambridge, I think it is in the UK, uh, in uh, 1990. And uh, he further moved in 1994 to the Department of uh, Meteorology at the uh, University of Reading, also in the UK where he served as head of the School of Mathematical and Physical Science between 2007 and 2010. Uh, in 2010, he, he became the Joint Met Office Chair in Weather Systems, and uh, he became uh, director of the Met Office Adler Center in 2012. Uh, since then, he has led the evolution of this center in order to focus on the climate science and services with the goal of providing governments, industry and society uh, with uh, actionable advice for mitigation and adaptation to climate change impacts. Uh, Stefan is currently a member of the Government Chief Scientific Advisors Network in the UK. And uh, he was previously a member of the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Programme until 2016. And he is a member of many others um, advisory panels. He received several awards for his research and uh, he is regularly invited to give lectures. And we had the pleasure to have him at EC Bern as a keynote speaker in 2019 uh, during our Earth Observation Workshop on Geohazards. So I stop here. Uh, Stefan, uh, the floor is yours now for about uh, 45 minutes and we, we are li listening to you. Well, Annie, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be back in EC in Bern, albeit uh, remotely. And it's a great shame that I can't see your faces as I give this lecture, but I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing questions later. Um, as I prepared for this, I looked at your Game Changer series and I was massively impressed at the diversity and depth of the subjects covered. Um, and this, this will be a climate presentation and it, it's given me an opportunity really to draw together some thoughts that, that I've been having over the last year or two. So, so this presentation is really a chance to share those thoughts and, and to test them out on this audience. So I'm very looking for, much looking forward to some challenging feedback and, and questions. Uh, let me, yeah, okay. So to set the scene just a little bit here, um, you'll all be aware of the um, Conference of the Parties meeting that was held in Paris in 2015. And that really, change the agenda for climate science. Um, at that point, we just about reached one degree above pre-industrial levels for the global mean temperature. And the scientific evidence to establish that the climate was changing and that that change was due to greenhouse gas emissions was really established by the community by that point. And it meant that at Paris, our leaders were able to reach some quite um, game-changing um, aspirations, in particular a pledge to keep global mean temperature below two degrees above pre-industrial and an aspiration to limit warming to one and a half degrees. And as I need not explain to this audience, that that's really a big challenge. 
alongside that, a long-term aim to reach net zero emissions by 2050, peak in greenhouse emissions as soon as possible. This was, of course, now six years ago. Um, an increasing ambition over time, and then a range of mechanisms to try and enact that. So this year, um, in November, will be the 26th Conference of the Parties, and that will be held in Glasgow in Scotland, uh, under the presidency of the UK. So there's an enormous focus on climate and climate change and what it means, particularly in the UK right now. Um, and so in preparation for this conference, um, I should say I'm listed there are some of the goals of COP26. In the run up to, to the conference, we held a, a, a meeting at the Met Office um, about a month ago now, um, Science for a Resilient Future. And really what we're trying to do is to establish what is the agenda for climate science now that we've established that the world is warming and it's due to, to greenhouse gases. So we had five topics there and some of what I'm gonna speak about today really came out of, of that conference as some of the talking points. Okay, so the way that I'd like to frame this discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, is to think about this as a journey. We know the end point of the journey, it's to reach net zero emissions. Um, I would add one key word to that. We need a pathway to a resilient net zero. So we need the path itself to be resilient and we need to be in a resilient state as we go along that path. So if we think of this as a journey where the end point is net zero, in any journey, what we need is a map and that map we can then use to chart pathways to that destination of net zero. And I emphasize pathways there in the plural because there are still policy choices about how we reach net zero. Secondly, we need, um, I did have compass here because I'm a bit old fashioned, but I've been persuaded that sat nav, the device you have in your car that tells you where you are and, and what your journey looks like. We need a sat nav to assess the current state of the climate, what it's looked like in the recent past, what's happening right now, what might, might happen in the immediate future. And I'd like to make that sat nav the center of the, the presentation today and just test with you some ideas that we've been thinking about in the Met Office for what that sat nav should look like. So we've got a map with our pathways to net zero. We've got our sat nav telling us where we are now and what the immediate vicinity looks like. And the final element that we take on any journey is a backpack. So a pack on our backs that prepares us for any hazards along the path. We know that the climate is, has changed since pre-industrial. We know it will continue to change over the next 30 years on that pathway to net zero. So what are the weather hazards or more broadly the geo hazards that the climate system might throw at us? And what's that backpack of equipment we need to prepare us for those hazards and to build resilience on the way? So as I say, what I'd like to do is, uh, I'd be very keen in the questions to talk about the other elements, but I'd like to spend the rest of the time today just speaking a little bit about the SATNAV and what that could consist of um, and what we might need to do to build that into a more operational system. And I should say here, I don't have it on the slide, that the World Climate Research Programme is looking at a set of what are called lighthouse activities. And one of those is around a sort of an awareness of what the climate system is doing right now. So, so some of what I'm gonna say here is being inspired by that, um, that lighthouse activity in the WCRB. So in the conception that I've got, there are three elements to the SATNAV. One is monitoring progress towards the Paris goals. So what is the climate system doing now? What do emissions look like? Are we, what's our progress to the goals and, and where are we now? I'm gonna talk a little about, a bit about extreme weather as, as my title suggests, and in particular, put those extreme weather events into a climate context. And I'll say a bit more about that later. And then finally, what, what does the immediate future look like? The next five or 10 years, and what can we say about 
the next five or 10 years. So rather than the long-term projections, which go out to 2100, what's the more immediate vicinity looking like? So I'm gonna step through each of those three, three elements uh, in this presentation and give you, just give you some thoughts, as I say, that we've been having in the Met Office for how we might stitch things together and where further development is required to, to build this, this sat nav. Um, I'm just gonna go back and, and just remind myself of whom I'm speaking to. So Issy, of course, you've got a very strong interest and expertise in satellite observations and SatNav of course stands for Satellite Navigation System. So I deliberately wanted to change the use from Compass to SatNav for this presentation to acknowledge your very strong expertise in, in the satellite area. Okay, so just to start with the easy bit, if you like, on the SatNav is to bring together the observations we're making of the climate system and what's shown on this slide here is a screenshot for dashboard that we've put together in the Met Office, which shows some of the indicators of, of change. So just, just moving through the panels very briefly, we've got carbon dioxide concentrations going up, wiggling up and down and showing the seasonal cycle. And I think in this series, you've got Corinne Leclerc come to speak to you in a month's time. And I think she'll be digging into that, that time series and what's driving that uh, in much more detail. In the top central panel there, we've got the global mean temperature. So it shows the outputs of all the main climate centers, including the Hadley Center's analysis, along with the University of East Anglia, showing the strong warming that we're all aware of, um, particularly um, since the early 1970s, which is now looking like, I think the most recent um, measurement I looked at, which was for March of 2021 was, about 1.16 above a pre-industrial baseline that runs from 1850 to 1900. We've got ocean heat content. We know that the ocean is, is um, absorbing the majority of the increased energy uh, associated with the greenhouse effect. Uh, and so we can see an increased global heat content in the oceans leading to sea level rise, of course. Moving round then, bottom right, we've got El Nino as one of the natural modes of climate variability. So this is something I've been pushing very hard as well as climate change. What does the climate variability look like? And I invite you to go and look at this dashboard and it will show you the, the current state of other modes of climate variability that, that are important to delivering weather to um, weather extremes around the world. We've got sea level rise, and then on the bottom left, we've got Arctic sea ice um, from satellite observations. And just one thing to, to point out there, you can see that the Arctic sea ice is showing much more variability since the mid 2000s to the present day. And that's associated with the thinning of that, that sea ice. And so when we have extreme wind events that can break the sea ice up, so there's a stronger weather dependence now on the sea ice extent. If we have a very stormy um, autumn season that breaks the sea ice up more, so you see much more fluctuations there now. Um, and of course, it looks like we're heading for um, an ice-free Arctic in the not too distant future. So that's stuff we've got now. Um, lots of it comes from satellite observations, although more could. And these are rather traditional Earth system variables. What we have less of are the other elements of the Earth system, particularly around the carbon budget. Um, and I know that there are missions going up that can help us with that to supplement some of this, these sort of more traditional climate variables. An area where we've been focusing in the Met Office is on um, extremes. So this is actually largely using surface-based observations um, but the scope for satellite OBS here is clearly very large. And what we've looked at are extreme heat on the left and rainfall events on the right. And for each grid point over the Earth, we've made a little probability distribution and we've made a local estimate of what the extreme is. So um, we use that then to look at the changes in extreme temperature events during the period. So in the top left panel there, you can see a map that's showing in parts of Europe, we've got a trend of an increasing number of four to eight days, for example, over the last 10 years 
in, um, sorry, per 10 years in increases in extreme heat wave events. Likewise, on the right, we're beginning to see similar patterns uh, in rainfall. Rainfall is much noisier, of course, so detecting trends in extremes is more difficult. But this up-to-date data set is really telling us that we are seeing more extreme rainfall events um, around the world. Actually, just to pull out there, you can see in, um, in the eastern sector of Australia, we're seeing fewer rainfall extremes, and that could well be natural variability rather than climate change. So I guess the picture I want to give here is that we've made great process, progress as an international community in gathering global observations to, as part of our SATNAV to, to monitor the current state of the climate. But I think there's a lot more that we could and should be doing and actually then serving that data in real time so that our decision makers, but also our citizens can, can easily access this information and, and really see what's happening right now. A second element of um, the observational part of the sat now for measuring the progress towards the Paris goals is emissions. So at the moment, uh, the Conference of the Parties under the United Nations Framework for Climate Change Convention, the UNFCCC, um, requires countries to report their carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions using a bottom-up method of estimation. So in the UK, we have various government departments, for example, the transport department makes estimates of emissions by the transport sector. Our um, environment department makes estimates from um, agriculture and other land use aspects of carbon emissions through that route. But these are all effectively counting exercises rather than a measurement technique. And I think there's a huge opportunity and really a pressing need to make a much more observational based um, estimate of emissions. And so this is a system that we've been road testing for the last few years. And apologies if there's some noise, my fan is running high here, it's getting warmer. Um, I hope that's not interfering with the sound. Uh, I'm sure the team will tell me if it is. Okay, so we're aiming to, what can we measure from atmospheric constituents to infer what the emissions might be? So there are two elements to this system at the moment. The first on the left here is an atmospheric transport model. And the second is some observation sites. And at the moment, the system we're using is a purely ground-based system. So one of the interests I've got in exposing this idea to this community is to explore the possibility of satellite observations in supporting this. So we take the ground-based observation sites, and we currently have five around the UK shown on the map there. And we use the atmospheric transport model to do back trajectories. So we trace backwards where the air has come from, it then passes over those observation sites. And we use that to infer what the emissions across the UK might be. And it's a fully Bayesian system. So mathematically, it's a very neat system. And this gives us an estimate of various greenhouse gases over regions of the UK. It is just a UK system at the moment. Uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, and because it's a Bayesian system, we also have uncertainties, of course, built into that system. So the next slide shows an example from methane. So we've got this system working quite well from methane now. Methane's emitted, as I'm sure you know, from agricultural waste, but also energy um, and natural sources such as wetlands. And the left-hand panel here shows the two methods. So the green bars are showing the estimates from this bottom-up estimate, effectively counting the area of land use, using estimates of how different land use or agricultural systems emit methane, and then adding them up over the UK. And the blue and yellow lines show this measurement technique, this Bayesian system that combines trajectory, air parcel trajectories with ground-based observations. And you can see that the, there's quite a high degree of discrepancy between the green and the blue curves 
from the period we've currently modeled from the early 1990s through to the early 2010s. And I had thought that the reason for that was the observational network was improved in 2012, because magically since 2012, those two estimates come much, much closer together. In fact, as a, actually partly motivated by this talk, we went back and we redid the calculations for the whole period just using the two observation sites that we only had through the 1990s. And actually it doesn't affect the inverse. So at the moment, we don't really understand why there is that large discrepancy. However, what is better news is that since 2012, the two estimates do come together quite nicely and they show a two to 3% reduction per year over the UK in methane emissions. But, but there's a huge interest in the UK to, to roll this system out for other greenhouse gases. Uh, carbon dioxide, of course, will be the goal, but there's, there are big difficulties associated with unraveling the role of land-based carbon, uh, land-based um, plants in, in their strong role in the carbon cycle. But we've got some ideas and I hope we can touch on that in the, the questions and answers. And as I say, at the moment, we're just using ground-based estimates. And the question is, can satellites give us that degree of resolution in the vertical and the horizontal that, that could make a system like this work? And then ultimately, of course, roll out onto a global basis. Okay, so there's a little, a few ideas there about rolling this out, um, monitoring progress towards the explicit goals in the um, Paris Agreement. The second element I would like to speak about is the attribution of extreme weather events to climate. So let me say a little bit more about what that means, and then I hope that will shed light on why this could be useful as part of this SATNAV. So really a collaboration between the University of Oxford and the Met Office over the last 20 years has developed this technique called extreme event attribution. And what we do to do this, it was first road tested on a heat wave that occurred in 2003 that extended over um, large swathes of Europe, France, Switzerland, certainly, and, and the southeast of the UK. And what we do is we, we take measurements of the temperatures observed in that heat wave, and we uh, use the observations to estimate how much warmer they are than an average climatology. We then use the climate modeling systems to do two sets of simulations. The first set of simulations uses pre-industrial level of greenhouse gas concentrations. And we use those simulations to estimate the probability of that 2003 heat wave event in that pre-industrial climate. And that gives us a probability of that event in pre-industrial. We then run the climate simulations with the known emissions of greenhouse gases. And that gives us an estimate of a 2003-like event in the present day climate. And by comparing the probabilities in the pre-industrial runs with the greenhouse gas runs, we can estimate the increased likelihood of an event like 2003 as a result of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. So it's increasing the probability of an event like that. Now, traditionally, we've been, we've been doing work like that for nearly 20 years, but it has been taking a very long time because of the computer resource needed to, to do the, the simulations I described. So it takes, it, it's taken some months um, to, to generate these attribution statements. And what we've been working on in the last uh, three or four years um, through the Copernicus Climate Change Service and, and some European Commission projects, most notably recently Euphemy, which is led by Peter Stott at the Met Office, is to make a much more operational system that can react more on media time scales. And I think the power of this is that in the UK, and I think probably broadly across um, Europe and, and the world, it's when we get those extreme events that the, the question of climate change really comes to the fore. And so being able to, to tell folk what the role of climate change was in increasing the chances of those 
um, events. It's firstly a great communication tool. Climate change is here right now. We're, we're, so we need to act now to curb the most dangerous elements. So there's a communications element there. But secondly, for um, infrastructure and for companies, it gives them a taster of the kind of events that are gonna come in the future. So it's almost a way of road testing resilience of infrastructure and operations of companies and organizations to the kind of events that will become more frequent um, in a changing climate. So being able to do this attribution in a rapid way, I think would be a really interesting element of this sat nav. And to give you three recent examples of this event attribution that we've worked on, uh, firstly on the left there, um, it's a while ago now, but the winter of 2013-14 uh, was really quite appalling in the UK. And I think, Annie, in France, you've got some flooding events right now. But we had a whole winter of, of really very, very wet. And we were able to say that uh, climate change that made this more severe and more likely, we weren't able to put numbers on it, but we were able to say it was more severe and likely. And also we were able to go to the next level of detail and working with economists and experts in infrastructure, um, we were able to put a cash value and say that there were 1.3 billion pounds worth of damage. So that's the additional dimension here, is, is turning this not just from an attribution of climate, but be able to say something about the damage that's done, um, because that, I think, again, begins to build a picture that whilst there's a cost to building resilience to climate change, and there is a cost to building this green economy with zero emissions, that will avoid damage um, and costs associated with damage with these extreme events. The second event was um, in 2018, we had a prolonged heat wave in late spring uh, in the UK. I think that was localized to the UK. And we were able to say that this was 30 times more likely as a result of greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, we could go further with this event and say that um, by the, using our projections, that by the 2040s, this will be a normal event. And by the end of this century, if emissions continue on their current trajectory, this would be an unusually cool summer. However, if we do mitigate with strong mitigation measures on a pathway that keeps us below two degrees, that will remain a normal summer. So again, part of the narrative here is building up a picture of the role of climate change in this event, the kind of impact, and here it was to health, um, and we were able to work with um, epidemiologists in the UK and talk about the, 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 the number of excess deaths associated with that heat. And unfortunately, it was a large number. But then also talk about how we might see these events in the future, both in a, a business as usual world where emissions continue, but also a heavily mitigated world where we bring emissions down. And then finally, on the right hand side, um, in Siberia in 2020, for the first six months, there were really record breaking temperatures. Now, not a lot of people live in Siberia, but this was a really persistent and record breaking um, event. And it was the first time that we, we road tested this operational attribution system that I described on the previous slide. We were able to make statements really quite quickly which showed that this event was 600 times more likely due to climate change. Well, 600 times more likely essentially is getting to the point where we're saying this event simply would not have happened in a pre-industrial climate. And it led to um, wildfires, um, a loss of permafrost and potentially enhanced greenhouse gas emissions as a result of that, but also pest invasion. So this is another element of climate change that we see pests um, moving and potentially diseases as well, moving from across, re from one region of the world to another. So that's the attribution dimension of the sat nav. So I'm just gonna now move on to the third and final element, which is the future hazards and risks. I'm deliberately being careful in my language there. By hazards, I mean the weather events that, that a future climate could bring us. So heavy rainfall, increase, uh, heat waves, uh, wind storms, weather hazards of that type. 
but what are the risks associated with those? And I'll, I'll come back to that point um, in a few minutes, but you can see that theme building in the attribution that I spoke of previously, the actual impacts and risks associated with these weather hazards. So just to begin this, this view of the future um, as part of the SatNav, the climate community have been running for a very long time now, long range projections of the climate um, out to 2100 and beyond. But a, a technology that's emerged in the last 10 or 15 years has been so-called decadal climate predictions. And the difference between decadal climate predictions and the, 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 the more normal projections that we use in the IPCC reports is that these projections, the decadal predictions, are initialized on the present state of the climate. So they're initialized much more like a weather forecast would be based on the current state of the atmosphere, but importantly, the current state of the oceans and the current state of the, um, the ice packs and the snow fields around the world. And the hope is, and actually the demonstration in these systems is that there's more skill associated with that initialization. It's still a huge area of research to understand where that skill lies and how it's better than just an uninitialized projection. But nevertheless, we do have these systems. And in fact, the WMO now gives an annual report on these decadal climate predictions. Uh, and the Met Office is the, is the lead center for that. So this panel shows the most gross output from these decadal climate projections, which is just the global mean temperature change compared to a pre-industrial state. So what you're seeing are those forecasts from 1960 out to our most recent one, which came out earlier in 2021. And the gray panels here are showing the range of projections that we would get from uninitialized, more traditional climate projections. So you can see there's quite a wide envelope of possibilities there. The black is showing the observed global mean temperature so it bounces up and down, shows a slight um, reduction in the warming rate uh, following the big El Nino in the late 90s out to the mid uh, 20, 2000s, sorry, and then the return to the warming signal. <coughs> Excuse me. The green fans here are hindcasts. <clears throat> So going back and making these decadal forecasts for these periods. So firstly, you can see that these green hindcasts are, <clears throat> excuse me, narrower than the, um, the gray fan. So it's giving a tighter level of confidence compared to the uninitialized projections. But you can also see that it's capturing some of the, some of the bigger changes in that global mean temperature. So notably, um, the forecast that started in 2005 going up to 2010, you can see that flattening in the warming because we were capturing the ocean system that was causing a reduction in global mean temperature rise. Um, the most recent forecast is shown in the blue, and you can see that that's back to a, a more business as usual warming. The additional element that we've added to these um, predictions for this year is the probability of exceeding 1.5 degrees. Now we're showing two things here and they are slightly controversial. One is the probability of exceeding 1.5 degrees in one month of the five year forecast. And those are shown in the, um, the sort of mid brown color there. And you can see that according to the most recent forecast, there's a 60% chance that for at least one month, the global mean temperature will exceed one degree. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the climate has exceeded 1.5 degree, but it's a signal that 1.5 degrees is a big challenge. The darker brown indicates the probability of exceeding 1.5 degree for a whole year in that five year forecast. And that's getting up to 20% by the end of this forecast. So, what constitutes breaching the Paris goal of 1.5 degree? There was a recent IPCC report on one and a half degrees that had some things to say about that. 
Um, but that's not set in stone. And it does feel to me that the SATNAV ought to give warnings of this to drive the level of urgency we need to, if we're gonna meet that aspiration of keeping global mean temperatures above one and a half degrees. Now these global, these um, decadal climate predictions of course give a much richer level of detail about global patterns over these five years. Um, I don't propose to, to go into those right now. And as I say, it's, a, it's a, a topic of huge research to investigate where the skill lies in those um, regional predictions. And there is some skill in some regions, I, I think it's fair to say, but, but we're still in a, in a great learning uh, area there. But clearly if we could use observations in a more, um, intricate way to constrain these decadal projections or use new observations from new satellite missions, for example, to tighten those, um, those possibilities, that would be a huge boon. And then the final point I'll make on these is an area of really active research is to understand how we, how we constrain the uninitialized projections that go further out into the future based on the information in these uh, decadal predictions. And there is there's some really exciting uh, new ideas there, um, which do narrow the fan of the longer term projections. Again, happy to pick that up in, in the questions. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this, but this, this uh, is, is a topic that I'm particularly interested in. With these decadal projections, as I say, we've got ways we've got a huge richness of information about what the present day and the near term climate might look at look like. So one of the applications of this, and I'm just going to check the time to, to see how much detail to go into this. I've got some time, so I'll let me just spend a few minutes on this before wrapping up the presentation. I'm going back to January 2014, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, was a very wet winter for us in the UK. And it led to lots of flooding. And one of the pleasures, dubious pleasures perhaps, of, of working in the Met Office is when there are is an extreme season like that, the telephone rings and the first question is, is this due to climate change? Second question is, should we have expected it? So this really got us thinking in a different way about how we might use the information from the decadal predictions to understand what extreme events could look like in present day climate. So this chart shows the monthly rainfall accumulations in the southeast of England going back from 1980 through to present day. And it's the January figures. So how much rainfall did the south of Eng east of England accumulate during January's going from 1980, 81, so on, up to um, 2014 in this case. And the black line shows the observations. And you can see that prior to this time, uh, the observations bounced around between something between 20 and 160 millimeters as, a, as an accumulation in January. And then that last point for 2014 showed that that January accumulated over 200 millimetres. So it was clearly a record breaking year within the context of the observations. But of course, climate change is affecting those observations. So we didn't feel that we could go back further back than 30 years with any confidence that the time series would be stationary. So what can we say about how extreme that is? Based on observations, that 2014 was a really extreme year by 50 millimetres almost. So, you know, a 25% record breaker. So what we then did was to use actually the data from the decadal runs to, to estimate simulated versions of synthetic versions of January rainfall for the southeast of England. And the red curves show synthetic values. We've got a big ensemble of this. So we can then use that big ensemble to really fill out the probability density function and look at the tails. And what you can see on the right hand side, I hope, I hope our um, pictures of me and Annie and Willie aren't obscuring this, is a box and whisker plot showing that when we look at that ensemble, actually um, there are ensemble members that showed rainfall um, of that 
magnitude. And in fact, one of them is shown as a red line um, on the left hand chart there. So the answer is in a present day climate, which has had climate change, we should have expected this degree of rainfall, um, albeit a, a far extreme. If I move on to the next chart and just look at different months of the year. So now this is looking at accumulated rainfall for each month through the year. And the red is the synthetic and the gray are the observed. You can see that for many months of the year, the synthetic data is showing accumulated rainfall that we haven't yet seen, but the models think is entirely possible. So we could, there's a 10% chance, we estimate, in the UK of uh, a risk of unprecedented rainfall in any, win any winter in any one region. So once in every 10 years, we'll have a record breaking event. And I have to say, as a communication tool for our ministries, this was a really powerful message to be able to give them. But characterizing present day risk using these simulations seems to me to be an incredibly powerful tool that we're not currently using sufficiently. So a combination of those observations with these synthetic um, observations from the model to really give a richer um, view on extremes. And in the last few years, we've been looking at um, using this tool around the world. It doesn't always work. There are lots of checks we need to do on the fidelity of the model for different variables in different regions of the world. Um, and it works in some places, in some variables and not on others. Again, very happy to pick that topic up um, in the questions. And I think I'm gonna skip this, just give me a couple of minutes to talk briefly about two other elements of the SATNAV. So I was just talking about sort of extreme weather events that could occur in, in present day and future climate. An extreme parallel of that, a high impact, low likelihood events, so these are more climate system changes, so tipping points, if you like, that could happen that really change our climate system and flip it from one state into an entirely different state. So the kind of things we're thinking of here are shut down in the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So this is big circulation in the ocean that takes uh, cooler water from the North Atlantic at depth brings it south and brings warmer water at the surface towards the poles. And there are estimates from previous climates using paleo records and from climate modeling that, that could shut down. So that's an example um, of a tipping point. And this map shows a range of tipping points. And the question here really is what early warning systems can we build into the sat nav that might suggest that this could happen so others include melting of big ice packs the greenland ice sheet or some of the big ice sheets um, in the arctic so again big role to play for um, satellite observations coupled with some neat modeling methods to provide those early warning systems so i think that's an area of science that really could do with a, a good synthesis and i think there are some calls for the IPCC to do a special report on this topic. Okay, so just before I wrap up, I just wanted now to emphasize this hazard to risks. So we've been talking about this sat-nav. In its basic form, the sat-nav sat -nav is observations of the weather hazards and the climate system, traditional weather variables. I've tried to indicate how we can expand that into risks to, to build in a more resilience thinking. And I just wanted to show you a tool that we've just been working on, actually, that we're hoping to showcase at COP in November. And, and this is part of a new initiative at the Met Office. We call it the Joint Center for Environmental Intelligence. And environmental intelligence is a neat combination of environmental data with artificial intelligence. So we're bringing in machine learning and artificial intelligence with our observational and our traditional modeling techniques. And what we're trying to do here is bring the hazard, so this could be flooding, heat, or other weather events, with a sort of three-way model to calculate risk. We take the hazard, we combine that with the exposure of the hazard. So if it's a flooding event, the exposure is where are the houses 
that might suffer damage associated with that flooding event. And then the vulnerability is what kind of damage might a building um, suffer if it was exposed to that. So the combination of this hazard exposure and vulnerability gives us the risk. And so we can use AI tools to bring together these three information sources and then compute um, a risk metric and then bring in some uh, visualization. So I'm just showing an example here as a sort of prototype of this tool. This is centered over Bristol in the Southwest of England, not far from where I am today, actually. Um, and it's showing overheating uh, in buildings. So what you can see is that there's an amber and a yellow. So the yellow is the more densely populated region where urban heat island effects are stronger. And the nature of the buildings means that the exposure and the vulnerability of the populations within those buildings are likely to be higher to higher temperatures. So I hope that just gives you a little taster of our thinking on how to translate these weather hazards, which are the sort of core business of the Met Office, into things that people can actually act upon and sort of build that more naturally into this sat now view um, of the, the climate debate. Okay, so I think I'm coming towards the end of my time. So I'm just gonna make a few summary remarks now and then I hope we can have some questions. So I've tried to frame this discussion around the fact that we know the destination, it's net, net zero. We need a map to chart pathways to decarbonize our um, society to get there. And I haven't dwelt too much on that in this presentation. The bit I have dwelt on is the sat nav. So how are we doing compared to uh, the Paris goals? What are the weather hazards looking like? And what's the role of climate change in them? And what's the immediate future look like? So it's this sat nav to really give us an awareness of what's immediately around us on our journey. Um, there are clearly massive scientific challenges associated with the observations, the attribution and the near term climate. And I've tried to indicate those as I go. But I'd also like to really emphasize some of the technological challenges, because in some ways we can have a go at bringing this system together. But what we need to do is to exploit much better the use of cloud technology to bring the data sets together in a way that they can be, they can have that layer of artificial intelligence placed upon them to convert them into the information people need. Our data standards need to be really raised. This is not perhaps the most exciting topic, data standards, but um, I, was, uh, I was in a discussion workshop on this and someone brought up the analogy of the internet um, in the early days of the internet, there were several competing protocols for how computers should speak to each other. And when Tim Berners-Lee found a good application of the internet in CERN and, and, and their computers speaking to each other, that demonstrated the value of computers speaking to each other and the protocol that, that um, Tim Berners-Lee and his colleagues developed stuck. So we need a prototype of this to, to really cement those, those information management systems as they're called. And then finally, this sat nav has to be interactive. So I think my community have been guilty of pushing data out and we need to build this sat nav in a way that is very centered on users. And again, cloud technologies and some of these new information management systems are building systems in a way that make it much more straightforward. You don't have to download CMIP climate projections, which are terabytes of information. You go in and pick the region you want and get a digestible scale of data that suits your application. And really this is moving towards a sort of digital twin concept. Um, so I'm massively excited about this, this idea and I hope I've conveyed some of that excitement. Some of this maybe seems like business as usual, but some of it I think is a little way off now. And so I'm really looking forward to hear your reaction and, and maybe hearing some of your suggestions for how we might do this and, and some of the challenges. So with that, Annie, I'll, I'll pause and, and um, see what questions we get. Thanks very much for this very informative and interesting presentation. Uh, I have seen that we already have a lot of questions in the chat. 
so you can we can you can uh, answer this question and uh, uh, information to the participants. Uh, if you want to ask question, yeah, there are two options. Either you write your question in the chat or you raise your hand and then uh, you will be allowed to, to talk. So, uh, Stephen, maybe you can uh, uh, stop sharing your screen. Yes. In order that we see you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so uh, can you see the, the question in the chat or, or do you want me to, to read them? Um, it might work well if you selected the questions, Annie, if you'd like to do that. Uh, okay, so um, one question was, uh, how likely are we to exceed 1.5 degree of warming in the next 10 to 20 years? I think you already answered that, but uh, you can comment briefly. Yeah, I mean, this is a highly charged question, of course, and I've I've shown the the, the chart that I presented earlier with those probabilities. So we, we've got quantitative estimates based on the near term climate prediction for the next five years. And so we're looking at 10 to 20 percent chance of one year exceeding that. Um, beyond that, I don't have quantitative estimates. And of course, we do get into a highly politically charged conversation when we start talking about this. Um, the, the audience will know that the IPCC is going to be publishing its next assessment, its sixth assessment report, and the Working Group One report comes out in August of this year. And so I suspect that will give us further evidence on, on how close we're getting to 1.5 degrees. But it, it's approaching with alarming speed, I, yeah. I would say. Uh, another question is, uh, what are your views on geoengineering to mitigate uh, climate change? Yeah, well, that's a very good question, isn't it? The, um, I'm not sure I've got anything hugely new to say around geoengineering beyond the question of unintended consequences. So I'm not aware of a proposal that doesn't have some unknown consequences. So there was a study done. Um, one idea, of course, is to put reflectors out into space on a constellation of satellites to reflect some of the incoming solar energy back into space so that less of it comes into the climate system. Um, the danger with that, of course, is around maintaining that system. If, if elements of it were to fail, we'd have a big spike in, in the, the climate. Um, the, um, the degree to which we'd be able to reduce the heating equally at all latitudes is an interesting question. Um, if we just block stuff out from the equator, we, we change the equator to pole temperature difference, that would have unintended consequences. So the unintended consequences are huge here and of course the ethical issues. And then finally, of course, scaling up of this. So I, these are well-worn messages. So apologies if I haven't said anything very innovative there. Okay, we we have two uh, hand uh, raised, but but I continue with the chat. Uh, one question is: uh, Do you link indicators of climate change and uh, geographical biodiversity loss? Uh, and do you have related prediction on extinctions hazards? So we do a bit on bioindicators, yes. Actually, that's very localized. So <laughs> the UK is a very strange country in many ways. And we've got, we, we had a tradition of folk recording what they saw, particularly members of the church. I don't know why this is. So we've got records going back, quite detailed records going back more than a hundred years on aspects of biodiversity. And so one of the things we had a report out earlier this year that demonstrated that the growing season in the UK, we can say is extended by about half a month as a result of climate change. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm addressing the question particularly. Let me, let me change the question slightly. I think we, I showed traditional measures of the climate system. I think if we could extend global measures using satellite observations, 
that included elements of biodiversity as indicated as a state of climate, that would be an enormous step forward in not only monitoring the climate, but also potentially constraining some of our projections of climate budgets, which I didn't really touch on today. Okay. Uh, I, I continue because we have several questions. Yeah. Uh, one question by uh, Jérôme Benveniste is, what is your view about the needs of uh, better integration within the ocean observing system to support their exploitation for prediction and projections? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and it being the decade of the ocean, of course, it's very much at the fore. The first thing, and I, I know this very acutely in my job, is that the Argo system remains, the funding for that remains very fragile. So ensuring that we retain Argo, and, and the audience will know that our understanding of the ocean heat content has been revolutionized through Argo. So ensuring a continuation of that is a real priority and then expanding that further. The more we can do with the ocean, and, and observing that, I think the better we can constrain those decadal forecasts. That's really, um, uh, 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 there's some definite low hanging fruit there, I would say. Okay, uh, one a question by uh, John Zarnecki uh, is uh, the following. As scientists, we are very used to discussion and use of probabilities. However, the public and the political um, classes are not so used to this. Do you have any thought uh, on this and how do you find decision makers in their understanding of these concepts? Uh, again, that's a very, very difficult question, isn't it? Um, so I think, interestingly, um, one of the effects of the COVID pandemic has been, firstly, science is explained um, much more regularly in, in both to decision makers, but also the general public. But also I think that um, at least in the UK, and I'd be interested in others' views um, around the world, that this, the fact that there is no definitive scientific answer to many questions and climate of course is, is one of these two. And so it, it's brought the whole concept of acting on incomplete evidence and with a range of, of probabilities and certainties much more to the fore. And so I really hope we can build on that experience um, to, to when we communicate our climate, climate science. Okay, uh, I will move to the oral questions and come back to the chat because there are many other questions. Mm. So, uh, Willie, if you can allow the, the first uh, um, participant to ask his question, his or her, yes, his question. Hi, uh, okay. am I coming through? Yes. yes. You can hear me? Okay, great. Um, first, I wanted to uh, make a general comment. I. Uh, I applaud the organizers for giving us this talk, which is not astrophysics. I mean, I love astrophysics talks, but they branched <laughs> out today. And I think I, I, I think that's a great idea because this is particularly relevant and important to us uh, these days. Um, so I have a couple of closely related questions and another question at the end. Um, how do you specifically tailor? I mean, how do you tailor your climate change talk to your specific audience? And how do you deal with so-called climate skeptics because they still exist? And my final question is, are we doomed? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, William. And, and um, I'm not the right person to give an astrophysics talk, so I'm glad you weren't <laughs> expecting that. Um, how do we communicate? Um, I think that was your first question. Um, how do you tailor your talk, basically, to, yeah, to right. the audience? Yeah. So I, I think that for the general public, at least an extreme weather event, and it, it sounds slightly ghoulish to put it this way, but it's when we see an extreme weather event that climate change really uh, um, attracts the media attention. And I think it's one of the reasons that this attribution methodology has proved so powerful because we can link that in a very direct way to climate change. So, so that will be one thing I would say. Um, as to your second question on the skeptics, actually since Paris, and I think Paris was a really pivotal moment in 2015, the mood in the UK in particular has really swung. So, so the call for action is very, very loud and clear here. Now I know it's not uniform in all areas of the world, 
but the evidence is so overwhelming now and, and so many governments are making commitments to, to net zero. It feels to me that the, 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 the debate has really moved on. And, and actually my concern is that the debate has shifted um, entirely to tech fixes around zero carbon energy production and that we're losing the debate about the need to adapt to climate change, both current and future committed climate change. So I'd be interested in your experiences, but the debate here is really pivoted in a very, very big way. Um, specifically on the climate skeptics, there are half a dozen arguments that are deployed and they're, they're reasonably straightforward to, to counter actually. Are we doomed? No, I don't think we are doomed. There are plausible pathways that can keep us below two degrees for sure. The difficulty is the longer we go before really deploying zero carbon technologies, the more negative emissions technologies we will need to deploy. So these are technologies that actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We have some, carbon capture and storage is, is one, so we burn some kind of fuel. So maybe we grow a biofuel, we burn it, we capture the carbon dioxide and we liquefy it and store it underground in old oil fields. We know how to do that, but deploying it at scale and the economics of that are really the challenge. Um, hydrogen economy, um, we kind of know how to do that, but again, deployment at scale is, is really the thing. So most definitely we are not doomed, um, but we, we, we do need to act. The peak in emissions needs to come really quite soon in the next five years for sure, if we've got a good chance of reaching two degrees. Right, okay, I think you partly uh, answer one question in the chat, but now we can... Uh listen to the second oral question. Oh, your uh, microphone is... Uh... Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you for a very pleasant talk and interesting topic. You briefly mentioned the uh, tipping points and among them the permafrost, but Nothing about the sudden release of methane from the permafrost clot rates, which may happen soon because recently in Yamal Peninsula are observed craters with quite a big diameter, roughly 60 meters or bigger, which are a result of explosive release of methane from decomposing clot rates. And this is in the Yamal Peninsula, one of the richest of methane region in the world, where the, a, a lot of clot rates under the permafrost. And this region is currently under the extreme heat. So probably we, we are talking mostly about steady climate change, but such events could change completely the situation. Yeah, Valentin, thank you very much for that question. Um, you're right that permafrost releases is something that, okay, so, so bringing it back to the presentation, I think this is where I see the map concept. So um, we, uh, using the map, we think we know the budget of carbon that we can continue, that we can release and still have a good chance of remaining below two degrees. You're describing an example of a natural process that could emit new sources of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that would reduce the budget that we would be allowed to, to release to, to power our economies. Um, at the moment, we estimate those things using pretty basic modeling and data. My understanding, but Valentin, I suspect you're a greater expert in this area than I am, my understanding is that we're largely observation limited here to know the degree of the, car, the, the methane stores in these peatlands and in these permafrosts to understand what might be released and the temperature thresholds at which they're released. But you're absolutely right that looking at heat waves in regions like um, Siberia, areas that aren't necessarily populated, it, it, it motivates um, 
a reasoning for really giving some focus to those. So I think you, you, you raise a really important uncertainty in our, in our understanding of the climate system here. Yeah, really good point. Thank you. Um, what, one last question in the chat is uh, about green energy. Uh, project. So the question is, uh, do you have any data uh, saying how much uh, they are currently reduced global warming? Okay, I, I would recommend you hold that question for Corinne Leclerc next month and ask ah, her that okay. question. Corinne, she, will, okay. she will definitely be able to speak to that. I can give a UK perspective on that. So in the UK, we have um, we have enshrined in law um, a carbon budget and a plan for achieving those carbon budgets and the government is held to legal um, challenge if they don't keep to those. The area that we've in the UK seen great reductions in carbon emissions is in our electricity generation systems. Now, some of that is because we now use gas rather than coal in our power stations, so that's a bit of a cheat but we have certainly scaled up the use of renewables in the UK. So there's about a 60% reduction in carbon emissions from electricity generation. So that's a really good news story. Um, it is possible to deploy renewables at scale and the cost of those renewables has changed enormously. And China is a country to watch here. They are deploying renewables very, very rapidly indeed and, and will decarbonize their electricity generation quite quickly would be my guess. If you look at the UK emissions, but the sectors that are harder, transport may be getting there. So we've got a pledge for no new, um, for all electric um, new cars in 10 years time. The sectors that are really hard are agriculture and land use. So um, we have great carbon stores in peatlands in the UK, but those peatlands are unstable. It almost goes back to the previous question. And then agriculture is a big emitter of greenhouse gases. So how will we feed the world's growing population in a carbon neutral way is, is a big deal. And so that requires changing to agriculture. It requires changing our attitudes towards diet and our consumption of meat as our primary source of protein, because meat is a very carbon intensive way of producing food. So, so good news on electricity generation, but it's those other marginal um, emitters that, that, that are the tougher ones that we'll need to tackle. Okay, um, so I think it's all in the chat. And if I may, I have two questions. Uh, oh. My first question is uh, you talk about decadal projection. Uh, in terms of global, uh, you showed the global mean temperature. Uh, do, do you have a decadal projection at regional scale? And my second question is about the link between extreme events and tipping points. You said that, uh, my un I understood that uh, maybe early uh, extreme events could be early warning of tipping points. And can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, good questions, Annie. So. Um, Sorry, yeah, decadal. So, so yeah, yes. let you know. <laughs> so um, the decadal predictions are weather models. So they have spatial, um, okay. spatial Maps. detail. However, mm -hmm. the question is how much predictive skill is in that spatial detail? So when we have a big event like an El Nino or an Atlantic multi-decadal variability, there is surely some skill there. But the amount of skill on the five to 10 year timescales is in an area of very active research. We think there is some in the Atlantic. So that drives European, particularly summer um, weather events. Other areas of the world, El Nino, not so predictable more than, um, more than six months ahead, as you, as you know, I'm sure. So, so very active area of research. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the speed that, 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 that field has not progressed as rapidly as we first hoped it would. Um, but there are signs, so uh, I don't know if I'm going to take too long now. One of the things that we're finding in this area actually is that the, the models don't seem to have as much predictive skill as the real world does. Now there's a whole other talk on this that Adam Scaife 
and the Met Office can give. So we're actually finding if we can build a very big ensemble of decadal predictions with several hundred members, now that's very, very expensive computationally, yes. Yes. actually there's more skill that we can detect there than in a small, so the signal to noise ratio is very, very low at the moment. Okay, okay. Um, your second question was around tipping points. Yes, so the there, link between tipping points and extremes. I think that's slight. So my personal view, and this is very much a personal view, is the early warning for tipping points needs new theory about the way the systems work. So on the Atlantic overturning, there's some nice theory that, that says that if we can um, so it's coupling theory with modeling with observations that says if we can measure the salinity um, on the uh, western side of the North Atlantic, and if we can get time series of that salinity, there may actually be signs of early warning. But I suspect each tipping point needs its own bit of theory okay. to find the key, key metrics to measure. But I think actually it, it's one of the reasons that Thomas Stocker and other are calling for a an IPCC synthesis report to really draw those strands together. I think it's really fascinating work that. Okay, thank you very much. And I think it's time to, to stop. Thanks again for this very interesting presentation. And uh, again, happy birthday. Because for the like participant, uh, you all have to <laughs> know that uh, yes. Stephen is uh, it's his birthday. I will not say your age. <laughs> no, it's, it's not Annie. It's it's my stepson's sixteenth birthday, so it's not my <laughs> okay. birthday. But I have a, a lot of teenagers about to arrive to celebrate with him. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you, and bye bye to everyone. <laughs>